Hey everybody, how's it going? All right, thanks for being here. And uh, let me get my track out. I'll play a little bit of playing some slow blues today. Why not? After that rousing intro. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right. How you doing, everyone? Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, of course, to Phil Mingan, who is the moderator with the mostest, I guess we can call. <laughs> and uh, as always, um, all my courses are on sale uh, for 20% off to my website, All True Fire Courses, and I have my great course, great course, my course that I'm really happy with. I think it's a great course. Uh, with Brett Papa called Blues Rock Masters, and I want to thank everyone who has purchased that and all the background tracks that people have been buying those. I really appreciate it. It helps a lot to continue doing this. Um, I have a gig. New York City, May 20, April 29th at 6.30 p.m., an early gig because they're doing a social distance thing, so there's only like three shows or three sets. So I figured I'm going to take the early set get my friends to come, people come right after work if they're coming in and out. So uh, it may or may not be streamed. Hopefully it will be streamed. Oh, um, Phil just texted, where is Evil? I was filming another video, so Evil will just, uh, he'll just do some push-ups while we're talking. Um, I was filming another video, which I'll talk about in a second. So the gig, they, we may or may not be streaming. It's the bitter end in New York City. So that's reopening, so I'm super psyched to be playing there with my friend Rodney Howard on drums. The other guys are, got a few, choosing the other guys. Rodney Howard's main gig is Avril Lavigne, which is pretty interesting. Great, great drummer. And he's on all those tracks that you guys have been checking out on Bandtrack. That is the drummer, so you can hear how good he is. So, all right. Um, I will, of course, be pumping my gig before it, more so. Um, and have a, a fun gig, a uh, fun video I'm launching on Friday about David Gilmore. I learned one of his solos, and I thought it'd be really cool to talk, to talk about him. It kind of goes along with the course, but I'm showing a specific solo of his, so that, I'm going to launch that on Friday, so we'll look forward to that. Okay, so why practice slowly um, or jam on something slowly? Well, let's just talk about a blues, because we talk about that a lot here, and I want to... Um, I love playing on a slow blues because what it hopefully allows me to think about doing is taking my time and thinking about what it is that I want to play. Now, obviously if you're playing on a, you want to do that on every tune, but uh, very often when I think I'm not playing a lot and I listen back, like on gigs, like, yeah, I'm really taking my time on this. I realize I'm not, I realize I'm completely overplaying. So when you take a slow blues like this track, super slow, it kind of, the slow stuff is harder to solo over sometimes than the fast stuff. Because if you want to know where your holes are, you know, if you're, if you're playing a really fast tune, sometimes the technique can be a, a hole, right? You're, <coughs> excuse me, I can't keep up with this tempo. But I find when you're playing a slow blues like this, you can't rely on licks and you have to think about making music, right? And making, connecting ideas. So the first thing I want to think about when I'm playing over something slow like this, and I'm going to talk about a few little kind of musical devices we can use or cool um, lesson stuff. All right, so I'm starting with my five chord. I grab that, right? So what I did there, and a slow blues can really allow you to think about this, and really those sound great because you're not rushing it. I started on my five chord, and I played my thirds of my five chord. I played the, uh, I'm sorry, it's a six, but the third of the, the B chord, which is D sharper than the B, then brought it back down. Now, when you take your time and look at these sort of ideas and practice something slow like that, you see there's a lot of opportunities that you may not be taking when you're playing a bunch of blues licks. So that five chord, the first thing I'm going to think about, I have that little shape right there. I'm just part of my B chord. I have the D sharp and the B, which is the three in the root. I'm going to bring that down to the C sharp and the A. And then, wow, check this out. There is the B and the G sharp of my E chord. So I get this cool so let's hear that little phrase then. Starting in my five. 
Tá bom? How can I? So it's gonna take a little idea, and then how can I start to expand upon that? All right, so I have the, the D sharp and the B. I have an E, and I have my C sharp, which is kind of the passing. And I'm gonna bring that up a whole step, which kind of is part of my D major, sorry, B major triad again. So I have the F sharp and a D sharp. Brown eyed girl almost in. And I could do that. So I want to incorporate that. So I'm thinking about this stuff as opposed to just blowing through licks, right? So my top. Yeah, kind of red house, right? Establish a phrase. Now I'm purposely not going to play to this measure. Back to the one chord. Now I'm going to repeat that same phrase. My four chord, or something like that phrase. So it's the call and response, it's the A, B, blues thing. Now I'm going to play something that really has to stand on its own. I built in a practice thing. So I'm only going to play, I'm going to do this call and response sort of idea. I'm going to play over the first, since it's really slow, you can learn to pace this. So I'm playing over the first bar, and I might rest, and then I might fill in on that second half. So I'm kind of doing a bit of the call and a bit of the response, and a bit of the call and a bit of the response. But I want to keep the idea coherent. Now, when you practice slowly like this, if you play a, just a lick over that, then you play that same lick and it sounds like a lick, These, this is where this stuff starts to fall apart. Where you're just, you're not thinking. And the idea of playing really slowly, it, it allows me to experiment and to really buckle down and say, okay, I'm only gonna play in these spots. And this is one thing, um, you know, I've been playing and gigging for years, but playing with Robin, for, playing with Robin Ford in a few gigs, and then doing some slow blues with him, in realizing, like, I, he can be so sparse when he plays when he wants to, really is amazing how it really opened my eyes. And, and having a great band who will listen to these things dynamically and follow with you. That's another point. If you're this track, I think is fun for this. If you are um, jamming with a bunch of friends, the dynamics are super, super important. Okay, so if you want to build these kind of things, it, it's hard to do if the, the guys are banging through or playing something really loud at a slow tempo. Okay, so now I can start thinking about adding in a chord tone. All right, so I want to start outlining the chords. And when I do this on the minor blues, I'm going to take those ideas we talked about before. Right? I'm going to target my natural third of each of my chords. All right, so I want to get that sound. And I'm going to go to it from a half step below each note. I'm going to play a half step below my E flat. My, sorry, my E chord has a G sharp, which is my third. I'm going to approach that G sharp from a half step below from G. Go up to B maybe. 
Now when I go to my A chord, it's C to C sharp. And I have that G to G sharp again. Then my five chord, D to D sharp. So we've talked about this before, outline and the chord changes, but let's hear how it sounds. And I got a keyboard solo coming up soon. Okay. Okay, you got that third. Now you need to get flat three naturally in a four chord. Natural three, flat three, and up one. I'm just taking one idea and I'm beating, beating it up. Just beating it up, beating it up, beating it up. Because I have the time to do that. I have the time to think about it. Also, when you're playing really slow things like this, I find I hear more stuff, right? I hear that chord coming. So if I'm going my one chord to my four chord, I heard that, I heard that, you know, I, I played those things, but when I'm playing really slow, there's so much freedom for me to think about following what's going on in my head. And you, I found, even whether I'm playing a jazz tune or anything, playing really, really slowly will make you think more. I know it sounds completely obvious, right? And of course, you know, you don't, if you're learning any language, you want to speak slowly and get the pronunciation right. But as guitar players, how often do we really do it, right? I'm just trying to reinforce that a lot of times we pick up guitar and we just want to, we just want to shred and play some fast stuff and you know, learn some Steve Ray Vaughan stuff or whatever. And then we forget that there's, uh, those guys worked up to this. So working on a slow blues is a really great thing to do. Okay, then I'll think about, I'm, let's talk about, I'll get some questions in a minute too. Um, I want to add in a chromatic note. So I have my flat five, right? Which is my blue note. Now we can talk about just working that in. So 
when I take my time with it, all I'm gonna just do is play flat fives or play with them. Here it is here, five chords. So I'm just going to spend the whole time thinking about my flat five. Where is it? <laughs> flat five. There's a switch. One idea, so I'm gonna beat it up, beat it up, beat it up, because this is practicing, and all that thing stuff hopefully sounds cool, but when you play it slowly, you start to really investigate the sound, and I feel like when you take the one idea, especially over a slow blues, and this actually all started, I called Keith earlier, Keith Williams, um, I'm like, what am I gonna talk about today? Because some days I don't know, there's always a million things to teach, but some days I don't know what I wanna talk about, or something that would just be, I want this to be fun, for me too. And I just woke up and I just started playing over a slow blues. I'm like, man, I just love doing this. It feels really good today. Um, and so I thought I'd roll with it. It's a nice day out in New York. So I'd stay inside and play a slow blues, you know? <laughs> um, I'm just thinking about, so we've bounced the idea of a Keith about, well, playing slow and working on particular ideas. And I kind of forget that I had done this a lot, right? And this is what, you know, Keith, it was really kind of cool to bring to, uh, to mind, like, oh yeah, of course, I always work on everything sort of slowly before I start playing it quickly. But when you do it in the context of something like this, a blues, I find it's a lot more fun than um, away from the, the music. Because it should always be about the music. So working on, say, something like the flat five over this, you're learning to work it in at the right time. All right, so just one other quick, uh, and I'll, I'll answer questions. Um, we can work on playing dynamically, all right? So well, slow blues gives you the ton of space to do that. And this track in particular, which is available on Bandcamp, it's called When a Man in Jam in E. Like When a Man Loves a Woman, nice slow blues. Um, and one of the points of this track, um, it's not so much trying to be a sales pitch, but what was important to me in a lot of jam tracks lack is dynamics. This is a real band. While we were in the studio, I was actually playing a solo and playing some guitar, and then I just took it out so you guys could do that. So they build with me, and, and so it kind of goes somewhere, hopefully. Um, okay, so dynamics. So one thing I'm trying to do is play, is vary the dynamics as much as I possibly can, right? So, that one. What chord are we on? Right. Four. Well, I suppose we want to start here now. One. Four. And back to one. Okay. Important to hear those changes. So I'm going to play super soft, right?
brings everybody in, right? Gets your attention. And answer a little harder, right? Five chord. Now you change your pickup. I'm going to bring it back down. So experimenting where you pluck in the guitar. There, okay, great. Talk about that in a sec. Okay, maybe if, if I comp. Those dynamics or everything. So you could just play through the whole tune and just try to be almost ridiculously dynamic, if there can be such a thing. Um, because you, by experimenting with this over something slow, you really start to think about, you know, I was playing by the bridge, uh, what will work and what won't work. And by also playing slow, and especially in a slow blues, I think you really start to know your instrument too if you're paying attention which is a total tangent I wasn't expecting to go on. But um, if you saw like how much uh, I was moving knobs, uh, it makes a difference, I think, because I'm here rolling back my volume. But primarily, I was playing harder or I was playing softer, just with the pick. Sometimes I bring up the volume and change the pickups for a different sound, of course. Um, bring up the volume to get a bit more gain. <laughs> Now the interesting thing, so I bring the volume. Now find that spot. So when I play a little harder, the distortion kicks in, I get more of the sustain, but I also have the overdrive and the amp and the, the volume on the guitar just right. So when I play softly, it, it reacts really dynamically. Um, that's what I look for in, a, in an amp and a guitar. I am fully aware I am playing a 1953 Les Paul, so a two rock. I understand that.
But that doesn't mean you cannot do this with the regular American-made Strat to a Deluxe Reverb, which is a great combo as well. What you sometimes lose when you want to do that is if you're playing through like a, you know, PV Rage or something, like a little practice amp, sometimes being very dynamic, it doesn't, doesn't work for you, you know? So sometimes your setup does make a difference to a certain degree, for sure, for sure, for sure. All right, um, let's get some questions. Um, I have a, uh, that, hopefully that was instructive. Um, I just wanted to talk about playing a bit on a slow blues and why I like playing and practicing things slowly. Once again, take an idea and try to run with it. You, I always say this pretty, pretty much every week. You know, you're practicing, you're not performing. You're just practicing. So I'm sitting here thinking about how can I connect this idea to that idea. And if I, oh, when I was soloing earlier, I made a, a mistake. Was it a mistake? Sure, but I tried to get out of it. And then by doing this at home, you learn how to recover from your mistakes. I think I played something, I mentioned it, and if you watch the playback, I'm like, oh, now I'll talk about that. So I was maybe getting that five chord, and I was a little late on getting to the five, and then I went like, you know. So I just fake it till you get it. I'm gonna hit a really bad note. Right, so maybe if I make a mistake and hit an F, I'm gonna to try to make it work. It may not. Could have just been a total dud, but if you experiment with something on a slow blues and just try to recover, experimenting, recovering is really important. All right, let me get some questions. I'll get the pop out chat. I said not to put that out for. You guys know what I'm talking about. A little pop out window that lets me see the questions. And sometimes when I first go on, I do that, and then I've got all these other windows, and then I. It gets buried behind every other window. <laughs> this is very exciting for you to know that, I'm sure. Hold on, okay. So, um, all right. Sorry, guys. Um, all right. Here we go. All right. What's going on here? Okay. There we go. Oop. That's not what I wanted. You might see a little something weird there. I just know it's a little out of focus. Okay. All right. There we go. I'll be back. Don't worry. Everything's good. The picture will return in a second. There we go. All right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, all right, get into the questions. First one, good roll call. Phil Mingan, of course. Uh, Jason Carter, as usual. Tom Minette, thanks. Phil Jones. Christian, um, Essie Nesbitt, Jim C. Graham, what's up, man? David Cromwell, Stan Samos. Uh, do you want some of the list? Zita, what's going on? Um, Brad, Dr. Brad, what's up, man? Um, Super Aaron. I'm glad you like the backing tracks. Cool. Jim Jack Jones. I'm happy I'm addressing this today. Good. All right. Um, this is from Jason Carter. Uh, what other styles of music apart from blues does this slow tempo playing actually work effectively? It's a good question. Jazz for sure. Um, just listen to Miles Davis play a, a ballad, right? It's crazy. Um, the pacing when he solos. Like just around about midnight, something like that. Jazz tunes for sure. Um, rock, like, you know, if you get a nice slow ballad, you, you, the, the tune at the top of the, uh, the, the show today is a tune of mine called uh, Highlands off of my first record. And that's super slow. And that's a lot of fun to play over. And I've worked, I think that, record, that recording is a while ago, but I've worked on that. I, I still play over that just to practice and see what other good things I can get out of it. Um, so it, it doesn't just have to be blues. I just chose a blues because, you know, we talk about blues a lot. You know the chord progression. We can figure it out pretty easily. Um, but any, any style of music will have it. Um, you know, if you're playing a, like, you know, Black Sabbath or something where I love and you're playing like a slower Black Sabbath tune, you can't get quite as dynamic because the whole band would have to be doing it with you. But in a tune, like I said, that tune like Highlands, if you listen to dynamics that was going on there, is really important to me. And on my record as Robin, um, there's a song called Marta, which uh, I was really happy the way that turned out, but it was very dynamic. 
because it allows the song, to, gives you room to breathe and it allows the song to take its, its own life. All right. Um, how far ahead are you thinking about stuff? This is from uh, Brazil Bush Rocks. How far ahead are you thinking about when you shift the dynamics louder, quieter? Is there a plan or formula for quiet for the four bars of build? That's a really good question. Um, let, me, let me think about it. Um, I'm just hearing it. I don't want to be like, hey, man, I'm just hearing it, you know? Like, I don't have any mystical abilities with this stuff. I just practiced a, a lot, you know? And I like to listen a lot. And I've, I've been surrounded, I've been so fortunate to play with some spectacular musicians who have opened my eyes to a lot of these things. So, um, you know, when I would hear Jeff Beck play, or anytime, and you're like, oh, man, he's just so dynamic on the instrument. There's like highs and lows just in the middle of what he's playing. It's amazing. Um, a general one, going to the five chord and getting a little louder on the five chord, that's a natural uh, kind of build up in the music, right? The five, everything's building up to the five chord, then you bring it back down or you continue to go higher. But the five is the apex of the blues, you know, when you kind of go like. Yeah. But that five chord, so maybe building up to that and getting as loud, make that your loud point. Um, but I don't think about, I'm going to go loud here, or I'm going to go softly here while I'm playing. I, I kind of just feel it, and that comes from a lot of practice and doing it. And you start to kind of figure it out. There is a natural sort of flow to the music that you're playing. And in doing a lot of active listening, um, uh, BP Blues by Larry Carlton off of the Last Night record. Um, it's like live from the baked potato. I remember thinking like, oh man, I can't wait to go to the baked potato. And I get to the baked potato and it's like, it's a tiny place in Los Angeles. It's a great place, but it's just kind of funny thinking like, it's like when I first started playing the 55 bar in New York, it's like the size of my apartment. <laughs> you know, or something like that. So, a um, uh, little off topic there. Um, BP Blues by Larry Carl, and that was one that was really great for me. Man, Dirty Pool by Steve Ray Vaughan, that is amazing. Um, uh, the other minor blues he did too, but um, Tin Pan Alley, either of those, he's super dynamic. So think about that. Are you, um, this is Phil Jones, are you actually dispensing with licks entirely and thinking up uh, exactly the tune you want? Or is there some small degree of leakage here? Yeah, you know, it's another great question. It's a really good question. Anything I've, anything I've played here, I have played before in some way. I might not have put it together exactly as I've done here. We're playing blues or you're playing rock or you're playing jazz. There's a vocabulary that is that music. So if I start playing some crazy atonal stuff, you're going to be like, I'm out of this channel. This is terrible because it's not the genre of the music. So yeah, I, I have things that have worked on you. I mean, that's just guitar speak, right? That is um, just what you play on a blues. So is that a lick? I don't see it so much as a lick uh, as it is vocabulary. So a lick to me is like, you know, and yeah, it's a cool lick, but it's a lick. Like that's one thing you turn on a switch and you use it and, and like excitement in a bottle and you know, those things that make the audience clap. <laughs> you know, you can play in the, the coolest stuff in the world and suddenly you start going, people really flip out. But it's effective, so you can still use it. Um, but what I try to do is just to put things in an order I've never put them in before. Um, I don't like... Um, Somebody asked last week, do I come up with the solos before the live feed? And I'm like, whoa, no, can you imagine like writing something like this is really long solo? So um, it's, a, a, it's a long-winded answer for um, some licks that have turned into vocabulary and I can trace a lot of them back to the standards, you know, Albert King, B.B. King, Freddie King, Steve Ray Vaughan, Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton, you know, all the guys who I love and talk about all the time. Um, David Gilmore, uh, Jeff Beck, all those guys, and you start to develop the, the vocabulary of the instrument. So, so yes and no. 
Um, okay. One thing, uh, Phil just, I'm back in some questions here. Phil said, yeah, one thing I should mention, yes, you, Phil was mentioning that I've turned pick around for a softer tone. Uh, most of the things I was playing is with the rounded side of my pick. So I can just kind of play it. Thanks for bringing it up, Phil. So here's the, the front of the pick, or the pointy part. And then the rounded part, the back part. Maybe roll that back, a little, little flute there. Rounded part, pointy. So, um, I don't know if you can hear that. I can kind of hear it here. Um, I can feel it though. So it's something to definitely experiment with. Um, okay. This is from Jim Jack Jones. I'd like to know how to start practicing these ideas in one position and moving them out of position. Okay. Well, you know, the first thing I would do is just, I'm gonna solo straight with E minor pentatonic in the open position, right? Just, you gotta start building up. <laughs> Sometimes when you play with the rounded part of the pick, you might miss a string because you're not used to you try to play something fast. Sometimes you miss it. There's my open E minor pentatonic. So I'm just gonna, or, you know, those kind of positions right there. Never worry about playing chord changes or anything, especially when you're playing the blues, if you don't feel really proficient, even in just an E minor pentatonic. So I'm gonna go back to that, you know, just I'll play for a minute. Right, so. You know, being able to feel comfortable just being able to do that, which takes a long time. But now there I targeted my A, still the E minor pentatonic, but for the four chord I went and played the root. Right? Now my five. Playing the root of my five chord. See what I mean? So I'm just playing E minor pentatonic and feel really comfortable with that. And then you move on to the next position of E minor pentatonic and start to experiment with that. I think that that's a great way to start getting into breaking out of positions and working on some of these ideas. Um, and when in doubt, I always play simply. You know, sometimes when I, I can get it out of my own head and start trying to play all sorts of stuff and they go back to that and I'm like, oh, that sounds best. Um, all right, this is from Carl Free, Free your, Free your how. Uh, verse in arpeggio fingerings, it, uh, oh, oh, how verse is it in arpeggio fingerings, is it necessary to get to this level of proficiency? Uh, fairly, fairly, I, uh, yeah, fairly proficient. Um, but you don't have to think about them as arpeggios. And if you I don't remember seeing your name all that much here. So if you want to look back in some of my previous videos, I'm sorry if you have posted before, I apologize. Um, I'm often just thinking about the chord shape, right? So if I, if I know what E7 looks like, you know, here. A7 and B7, so E7, my A7, here's E7 here. So are those arpeggios? Sure, but I'm also just thinking about the chord. A7. chord so I'm just 
the, the word arpeggio, which I, you do need to know them, but can be pretty daunting because it's a lot of work for sure. Just think about the chords right now in one position and start to outline those. Then you start getting into playing your arpeggios through like the back door. Uh, um, can I talk about from moving to the major and minor pentatonic? You know, I, I, I could and I would and I will for sure. Um, I don't think about it that much anymore. I think about it as hitting the chord tones and as things are based around just playing the one, four, and the five. Um, so I don't think about it as mixing major and minor pentatonic anymore. I know it sounds kind of like, well, it's not, it's not anything. It's, I just don't think about it that way because mixing major and minor pentatonic doesn't really solve the problem. It's like a, it's like a little band-aid. Uh, it'll get you to the sound um, of changing the chords, but if you start thinking about the chord shapes, as I would, said a couple of seconds ago, you will be changing major, minor, pentatonic, but you're actually making the chord changes. Does that make sense? Hopefully that will make sense because um, the general formula that you might be asking is on the one chord I can use the major pentatonic, on the four chord I can use the minor, and in the five chord I can use the major or the minor pentatonic. Clapton kind of does that in Crossroads and that beginning kind of thing where you hear like, you know, uh, Paraphrasing. Then, so he's kind of going from his A major pentatonic, then, then to A minor, because it makes some of the changes for you. But I really pulled away from that way of thinking uh, because it ain't right, <laughs> and I'll fight you on it. Okay. Um, favorite aspects of Eric Johnson's guitar playing? All of them. I love Eric Johnson. Jeez. I've seen him a bunch of times. I saw him, and there's a concert from Live at the Bitter End from like the late 90s or the early 90s. The early 90s. I saw that show. Um, I was just a kid, and um, he's great. I don't, I don't have a favorite. It, his chord playing is spectacular. The lead playing, he's just great, you know, just Eric Johnson. So I don't know what to say. Um, I would say maybe if you're getting into his playing, spend a little more time on the chords that he plays because they're uh, really cool and super useful and not, I don't think, spoken about as much as the lead playing because, you know, for obvious reasons. What's the most common keys that you recommend playing these types of practice sessions in? Obviously, E, A, C for starters. Yeah, okay. This is Richard and Sarah. What's up, Richard? Um, hey, Frank Gladden. What's up, man? How you doing, Frank? All right. Um, Richard, yeah. Um, e blues, A blues. D blues, G, C, did I say D, B, and if you want to get, you know, you start playing with horn players, it's B flat, F, and the dreaded E flat, because <laughs> E flat sucks on guitar, you know, so you just tune the guitar down a half step and play an E, but, um, you know, E blues, A blues, start with that, G is super common, all the kind of cowboy chord keys, the singer keys for guys. So um, those, are, those are the ones I'd recommend. Um, all right. Um, you sent me a question message to my website um, a few days ago. Okay, yeah, I, I, I might have gotten it, Graham. I'm a little bit backlogged on, on that because I'm trying to get a bunch of things done and I'm looking at my website going, I got to answer all these people. So also if you contact me about lessons, I will get to you. Um, I just got a little, uh, I try to do these things in, in sections because I, I, I'm trying to get some videos recorded. I'm trying to launch the channel, my own subscription channel. So I got a, a lot of stuff. So I will get to you. So thank you for emailing me, Graham. I'll get right back to you. Um, all right. You're actually, this dispensing with licks entirely and thinking about exactly the tune the way you want? Or is there some small degree of lickage? I think I answered that one. Um, so yeah, okay, sorry. I answered that one. All right. Um, could you, uh, this is from Zeta. Um, uh, Phil's texting me. Can you address the slow playing invites uh, more to play with 
to play with fingers instead of a pick. Yeah, you know, I play with my fingers a lot too. I don't know if I was doing any. Um, uh, when I play with my pick, right, my fingers versus my pick, um, I'm usually doing that little move like that. So I will have the pick in my hand. I'll, it'll end up being between my first and second finger. So if I do that, it kind of falls to the hand. Now. I love the sound of the fingers. Pick, you know, the round part of the pick. Pointy part of the pick. Fingers. And you get that kind of cool snap out of the fingers too. All right, so um, I'm just putting my finger, all right, I think I'm back, I saw a little dip there in the connection, so. Um, just, see, I'm just using my, my fingers, sometimes, and I'll hybrid pick all the time too. So sometimes what looks like that I'm playing with my pick, I'm actually playing with my middle finger. Like all that was actually my middle finger. I'm just keeping my pick in place, so. Pick, middle finger, pick. So I might alternate between those two. Hopefully that'll answer your question. Um, all right, jump into the bottom here. Playing an E minor like that is exactly better than trying to play in each position um, for each of the chords that they pass. Yes, I would say Spend your time nailing that. Um, what's the best course to start with uh, of mine? Um, I don't know where you're at, but um, I would say uh, the Blues Guitar Survival Guide, uh, Volumes 1 and 2. They're a little old. Um, the inf information's still good. They're just, you know, I look 10 years younger. Um, those are fun. I like those. Uh, if you want to get more inside things, um, maybe the blues arpeggios is great because then you're starting to uh, get into playing the changes. I'm not sure where you where you are level wise, so um, that's a tough one. Um, right, uh, Keith is saying we don't like E flat, but we like C minor. Sure, I love C minor, but E flat seven, right? So you're talking about the E flat blues, then you've got to go to a an A flat chord, and then, so you really kind of got to know the guitar with not really so much based upon the fret markers, <laughs> you know. So, okay. Uh, all right, so, just one more, uh, I think that, that, that's kind of cool. So any more questions while I kind of wrap up? But I really appreciate everybody being here. Um, a good hour. Um, Albert Collins said, "Why you have five picks in your hand, why would you need anything else? Yeah, you know, if you want to play fast. Can't do it so much with the fingers. Some people can. Who's that kid, Mateus? No, well, there's a guy, the Brazilian kid, plays with his fingers, ridiculous. Mets or Yankees? I don't care. <laughs> uh, my family is traditionally a Mets, fan, Mets fans, but that's just really kind of, you're just torturing yourself all the time. I go to baseball games because I live in New York, but um, I am knew nothing about about uh, sports. Zip zero jumbo, not a thing. Um, I'm the guy like whenever I played basketball, I would jam my finger, and then I wouldn't. I would then I couldn't play guitar. So, um, so I, yeah, I don't know anything about sports. It's pretty funny though. Uh, but definitely the Yankees over the Red Sox. That's just because you live in New York. But I would say I'd go, I would say, uh, not Mateus Sato. there's another guy, um, Mateus Sato's great, but he doesn't play with his fingers. Mancuso, I think is his name. All right, well, you can check him out, he's ridiculous. Um, Mets, 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 Mets. I like the, I have a, you see my dad was a big Mets fan, so I'm just gonna also roll with the Mets, just because, you know, because sometimes rooting for the Yankees, it's like, um, they always win. 
But, you know, versus the Red Sox, you live in New York, you know, you got you to gotta go with the Mets or the Yankees. Okay. Um, yeah, like say, I know nothing about any sports, so you can say whatever you want. Um, this is uh, Brett Nuremberg. You said, I've learned pentatonic and major scales by sound and feel versus shapes and positions so I can move around the fingerboard. I've often feel if it's, uh, this has limited me. Maybe not. I think if you start to see the, chord, the chords that exist inside those scales, I think that would not so much be limiting. If you start seeing chord tones, that's the way, uh, the way to do it. That is really the way to do it. Um, I start up with you like knowing the pentatonic scales, but then I started to go like, oh, you know, um, seeing those chords as they exist inside the scale is the way to think about it. Hopefully that helped. All right, so um, look for a video launched on Friday um, on David Gilmore, kind of a bit of an extension on some of the course stuff I did with Brett. All my courses are 20% off, of course, as always. And I have the merchandise below, the mugs, the, the t-shirts, uh, the background tracks, all sorts of stuff. I'm also putting together a little book for everyone um, to check out. You know, just kind of like uh, a little resource guide. So that'll be, uh, I'll have that pretty soon. So when I start talking about triad and versions and things, you can have them in front and you can follow along. Um, so that'd be kind of fun. So thanks to everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you to Phil for uh, everything he does. So helpful. Thanks so much, man. Thank you to Keys 5 Watt, as always. And Tom Manette, everyone else who's chiming in today. Thank you. Um, and I will see you guys next week. Also, yes, make, knock it on your calendar. Is the bitter end in New York City, uh, April 29th at 6.30 p.m. I think there's only like 12 tables. They're only having like 25% occupancy. So um, it should be fun. And I'll see you guys all, uh, see you guys later. Thanks.